My name is Melody Knowles, and I'm the Acting Dean and President of Virginia Seminary for 2016, and it's my, it's my deep, deep pleasure and honor to welcome you all here today. Alums, faculty, students, staff, and friends to this 2016 alumni con convocation, including those who are watching online. This year's convocation features the Kreitler Lectures, and in just a few moments, you'll hear from our Kreitler Lecturer, Mr. Ed Begley. This lecture, we are pleased to say, is honored from, our, from the Kreitler Environmental Fund. And we're deeply honored that Peter Kreitler and his wife, Katie Kreitler, are with us today as well. They both founded this Kreitler Environmental Fund along with family members and friends and have continued to support it generously through the year and we are richer for it. As most of you know, the Kreitler Fund supports environmentally focused programming and activities here at VTS. Everything from lectures such as this one to our ongoing work with beehives and gardens and um, everything for a campus-wide campus sustainability effort. I'm pleased to ask that our own Canon Peter Kreitler, alum of this school, um, is here to introduce our guest lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Canon Peter Kreitler. Thank you and welcome. It's such a pleasure. Somebody once said to me, we've been, a gr been given a birth we didn't request and a grave we cannot escape. And the time in between defines who we are. Well, I got lucky because my mom gave me a set of books and my dad gave me a set of books. My dad taught me Sunday school and then became the senior warden at Christ Church, Short Hills, New Jersey. And then his retirement years was very active in the Ocean Reef Chapel in Key Largo, Florida. The book of scripture was in one hand. My mom, on the other hand, was given a piece of property on Cape Cod that her father built in 1938. And Katie and I were there yesterday because it's still in the family. She was the environmentalist. She gave me the book of nature. The book of scripture and the book of nature have informed who I am. And because of my mom and dad, this lecture series, which has included the likes of Dr. Ellen Davis from Duke, Bishop Richard Jones, Bishop of Liverpool, and more close to home, Bill Baker, the head of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and most recently, Robert Stern, the architect of the gold lead certified chapel that is the chapel for the ages. My mom and dad would be proud of you all sharing in this experience with us today when I introduce Ed Begley. But first, a shout out to some friends. Martha Horn, Ed Hall, who sat down with me and listened to my vision. I said that VTS could become a voice for the voiceless in creation. And then it was Ian and Barney who carried the torch, and now Melody, as Ian is away. To the faculty and students who listened to Thomas Aquinas, who said, the divine is represented in the totality of creation not in any one species, ethnic group, religion, nation, but in the totality of creation. Wake up, Dad. <laughs> That's great. That's great. The gift of technology. <sighs> Another one of those hands, but I don't have a third hand. To the faculty, to the students, to those leaders of this community, thank you for your commitment. Thank you. And a brief aside, if scripture were being codified today, we'd be hearing the names of 
Paul Watson, a man who puts life and limb online all the time for the great whales of the sea. Or Julia Butterfly Hill, who sits 150 feet up in trees just to save them. Or John Quigley, who travels the world to be with indigenous people who are lose, losing their property, their native lands, to development, to sea level rise, to climate change. Or to Alexandra Paul, who fights for sane population programs throughout the world. And one of my favorites, David Suzuki, a physicist, a Canadian citizen who's been granted the Environmental Prize for leadership. And of course, Ed Begley. We'd be listening to these folks no different than listening to Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, if scripture were being codified today, there would be scribes at the computers writing about these five folks that I just mentioned. The mirror, the mirror bearers of the past, those prophets I mentioned, ask us to reflect on our behavior. We study those fellows. We should be studying the other five I mentioned. They are no less impactful, no less important, for the collective message of the prophetic voice today is to do what? Get off our couches, put down the remote, stop paying attention to social media, engage in shifting the paradigm so that creation does not collapse and the human story slip through our fingers. And thus, we turn to the Kreitler Environmental Lecture. Ed Begley Jr., a prophet walking among us and with us as we slowly begin to understand the reality of today's environmental crisis. Ed models the ethic of living simply so that others may simply live. He enables the human family to gain confidence in rethinking how we are living on our fragile island home. He empowers those among us who are too often timid to speak truth to power so that creation does not slip completely through our fingers. A husband, father, activist, and man of humility is literally a voice for this age. We have the chapel, which is the chapel for the ages, and now amongst us is the voice for this age and I'm not being facetious. <laughs> Quietly pursuing a career, often facing the Hollywood blacklist for his environmental activism in the 90s. True. He has been fulfilling a calling to preach and teach the truth to, to talk about Mother Earth. I said to myself when I first heard his name about 40 years ago, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> he puts his entire week's garbage in the glove box of his car. The entire week. He rides his bike to work. He uses alternative transportation. He lives in a modest, sustainable home. He's a vegan. And he believes everyone can be green. Who is this guy? Well, the celebrity became a friend. And when it happened, I was doubly impressed. For here's a gentleman who walks the talk. No Hollywood pretense here, folks. None. Zero. By living simply, he mirrors what we are called to do as Christian men and women. Live simply so that others may simply live. He doesn't wear it on his sleeve. He just emboldens and empowers others by the way he lives. As a matter of fact, he does exactly what I did for my last sermon when I resigned from parish work in 1990. I said to the congregation, if there's anything that you can say about me, hopefully you can say this. 
Ed Begley's belief and behavior lines up. That, to me, says it all. A rare and treasured gift, when duplicity is often the rule of the day, among some of the most prominent in our daily headlines. I call my friend Ed a bridge environmentalist, a term I used for two of my teachers when I was here at Virginia, Jim Ross and John Wolverton. They were bridge historians for me. They made the Old Testament come alive and the New, Time, the New York Times come alive. Remember John Wolverton with a carrying to school every day? Ed makes the, pal the message palatable and understandable to the skeptic, the critic, and the devotee alike. No anger in his voice, no vitriol in his choice of words. He has become an international apologist for providing CPR to the planet, conservation, preservation, and restoration. As a matter of fact, he doesn't know it, but he speaks Hebrew. He talks about Avodah and Shomer. Raise your hand if we got that. Atta boy, Jimmy. <laughs> Keep and serve creation. Look it up. It's in Genesis. Avodah and Shomer. CPR for the planet, embodied in this young man who's going to speak. One of my favorite Begley's best quotations goes as follows. We can all start by using alternative transportation once a week. I mean, what are we thinking when we drive a 3,700 to 4,000 pound vehicle a quarter of a mile to pick up a loaf of bread and a dozen eggs? Think about it. We could use the one quarter mile exercise. Practical suggestions for a person Personal, sustainable lifestyle translates to institutional behavior, like being aware of the impact of what you put on the end of the fork every time you take a bite to eat. This is part of the Begley method of how to shift the paradigm to slow the collapse of creation. However, I'm partial to this Begley's best. It goes like this. This environmental crisis is a deeply spiritual issue. Do we want to spend more time trying to care for our fellow human being, or do we want to just pursue more virtual reality? That is the issue before us, and it's being played out in the world of the environment. It is a privilege and a pleasure for Katie and Peter to welcome my friend Ed Begley our friend Ed Begley, whose lifetime of service to creation has emboldened me along the journey. To Virginia Theological Seminary, the most prominent, sustainably focused seminary on the planet, Ed Begley. Wow. Thank you, Peter. That might be the best introduction and the most generous introduction I've ever had. I'm not sure I deserve it, but I say thank you to you and Katie for having me here and everybody else involved in me being here, to Sheila, Melody Knowles, and everybody for all their kindness while I'm here. Um, a lot of people came up to me and said, I'm looking forward to your talk, to which I responded, I think, to each of them. So am I, because <laughs> I never know quite what I'm going to say. I try to uh, be very real and spontaneous and talk about things that have just occurred, like Robin giving us a wonderful tour of all those great gardens here, the vegetable gardens, and what she's doing with the soil and the ecosystem here. Thank you, Robin. And Reagan Sutterfield, who's written a wonderful book on soil, very important that we reserve uh, and revere and preserve soil, real soil, live soil with worms in it and organic matter in it, not dead soil. We'll talk about what I mean by all that in a little while. I promise I will talk about the environment at some point. 
Um, but first, I want to talk about something very important to me today. I usually try to have a theme, and my theme today is to just slow down. And if I put that into play, if I put that into practice in my life, I'm able to do more, to be more effective. I know what many of you are saying. Ed's telling us to slow down. The coral reefs are dying. Climate change is runaway. We have all kinds of problems, air pollution, water pollution, contaminants in the water. We got to slow down. We got to pick up the pace. We got to pick up not just the pace and paste up some things in the walls. Pick up the pace. Um, we, have to, we have to get moving. What is he talking about? I have plenty of energy in my life. I don't need any more pick up the pace. I need to just slow down so I can be there to do the incredible work that needs to be done. We need to slow down so we get centered and have some sense of balance in our lives before we do the important work, because we have a lot of work to do. But I think we all need to just slow down and enjoy these moments like this one right now. Here it comes, where I think we have everything that we need. I don't see a lot of people here. I don't see anybody here that looks like they slept in a, a cardboard box last night. I think we all have everything that we need today, but we need to separate between the things that we think we need and the things that we do not need, the things that we want. A lot of people have long lists of things that they want, and we also then have that other list of things that God and creation gives us, which are the things that we need. And I think we, every, to a man, everybody here has all the things that they need. And if things, if things in general made you happy, There'd be nothing but happy people in Bel Air and unhappy people living in the bush, and I'm not sure that's the case. Um, and slowing down is essential to me, so we're able to recharge and go out there and do that important work. I've been a type A personality my whole life, and if I can reach only one person today with the important notion of just slowing down, and that one person is me, <laughs> and I actually listen to the words I'm saying on this mic, I'll be grateful because I rush, rush, rush my whole young life, 20s, 30s, my teens, certainly, 20s, 30s, 40s, rush, rush, rush. And then I heard about an event that happened to a friend of mine, Dick Stahl. He's an actor. Dick Stahl did a lot of work, a wonderful guy, and he decided in the early 70s he was going to go to a place far away, somewhere near Bali in a little island somewhere, someplace called the Temple of Tranquility, and he was going to get enlightened, because the Beatles had just done it. They had gone to the Maharishi, and everybody was inspired by that when the Beatles went to the Maharishi and tried to get enlightened, and perhaps did to a certain extent. So Dick Stahl, my friend the actor, decided he was going to go to the Temple of Tranquility, this remote place. And being a type A personality like me, he had everything planned to a nanosecond. Everything was planned perfectly because things never go wrong, do they? <laughs> he had a flight from LA to Hawaii. From there, he had a, several hours, plenty of wiggle room to get the flight from there to the Philippines. From there, he had, got a fare on a merchant marine vessel, the vessel that was a low-cost kind of a fare. He would go to somewhere, an island, part of Bali, and from there, he'd take a little sandpan, a little small boat, and go to this place, and he had the instructions of how to get from there to the Temple of Tranquility. Well, life is what happens when, you know, God is making other plans for us. And the flight was late leaving from L.A., and he didn't have a lot of time. So he had a race to the gate in Hawaii and get there right as they're closing the gate, and he missed the flight from Hawaii to the Philippines. So, of course, he couldn't get on that boat, the merchant marine vessel. And to get another fare in one, he was in the Philippines for a while, and he finally got another birth on another vessel going to this island part of Bali. And from there, he took the little sandpan. It was monsoon season. It was very hard. He gets, kept getting stuck at every turn. Finally, when he got off the dock and ran up to get into a little rickshaw, and he was very close to the place, he said to the driver, he said, the Temple of Tranquility, and step on it. <laughs> and the driver wanted a tip, so he didn't want to laugh in his face, but he started rocking like this, and he saw the absurdity of it. And I saw the absurdity of it after that story, and I realized I need to just slow down. If I'm going to save the coral reefs, or I'm going to save parts of Florida from climate change, hopefully all of Manhattan from climate change, 
and save the things that need to be saved, the many species in the web of life, I need to just slow. It seems counterintuitive, you know, that wonderful Eastern saying, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> we have plenty to do. I know we do. I don't mean to mock that. But we need to be centered and have that time to recharge, and I hope we all do that in your wonderful work that you do as clergy, the wonderful work that you're doing here as seminary students, the wonderful work that everybody in this room I know is doing, because I've met a great many of you. It's essential that you do that, I think. That's my theme for today, just slowing down. There was a great writer by the name of Alan Watts, wrote a book about it. The book was called This Is It. If you read any Alan Watts, he's a pretty enlightened guy. And if you are just walking past the bookstore, B. Dalton booksellers, and you see the cover, you might get it. The idea is right there in the title, this is it. That's really all we get. You can live in the past and you can live in tomorrow. And there's value in remembering things so you don't repeat the same mistakes. I understand that. But I know now and have known for many years I have everything that I need right now. I may not get what I want, but I do get what I need. What do I need from the environment? I need to spread the word as Peter's done for such a long time. Many other people he spoke about have done for, for such a long time about the web of life, the sanctity of life. There are people that I've heard mock different species and say, I wouldn't give, there's a radio DJ, a, a very different way of thinking than me. He said famously for a while, I wouldn't give one California job for all the spotted owls in the world. He said that and I think he means it. And uh, I think that's missing the point. Because if you lose the spotted owls and you, you lose the forest and you lose all those things connected in that web of life, you do so at your own peril. I don't know if there's anybody here from the aeronautics industry, but I, if anybody knows, please tell me. I've been asking this question for a while. How many rivets can you lose from an airplane before it ceases to fly? Well, now, the, it depends on which rivets. Here's somebody that knows in the front row. Thank you. And there's some, at some point, three, 23, 103, you could probably lose just one really important one, and you could go down. But there's some point where you lose too many rivets, and the plane will not stay aloft. All those many species, the spotted owl, the sequoias, the redwoods, they are rivets in this airplane that we all need to stay aloft to be here today hydrated and fed and clothed in a comfortable temperature in this room. And keep in mind, there's a long history of good environmental stewardship. There certainly were the Huns sacking Rome many, many years ago. There's lots of bad stewardship you could look at as isolated incidents. But the fact that we sit here hydrated and fed and clothed and comfortable is a reflection on we've been more good than bad for thousands of years. Things are now tipping the other way. They're tipping the other way. We're losing all the goodwill and uh, the, the biomass and everything that we built up over many thousands of years of human civilization. And that's, doing that is doing so at your own peril. How do I get involved in this environmental realm? People call me environmentalist. I think I'm just, I, I think I'm just a Boy Scout who grew up or something. I grew up as a Boy Scout and I saw nature up close and personal and thought it was worth preserving because I love nature. And then I began to see the connectedness between my life and my needs and what nature provided. And also I knew firsthand the price to be paid by being a poor environmental steward. I grew up in a town called Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s. I'm sure you've heard of it. <laughs> you've probably heard of the LA smog too. So when they were talking in 1970 about having something called Earth Day, at that point, I had lived two decades, 20 years in L.A. smog. I said, well, what are you going to do for Earth Day? What's the idea of Earth Day? What are you going to do? I asked some people who were organizing it. I said, well, we're going to help clean up the air and clean up the water. I went, sign me up. I had lived in that horrible choking smog for 20 years, for two decades. I'd go down to the Santa Monica Bay and see the horrible pollution. I'd also seen something, not up close, but I saw it on the news, that I think contributed to the first Earth Day in 1970. Something happened outside Cleveland in 1969. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. The Cuyahoga River caught fire. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I think it's a bad idea when rivers catch fire. <laughs> I think it's a bad sign. 
There was so much pollution on that river, some of it was flammable. Somebody lit a match and dropped a cigarette. I don't know how it happened, but it started to burn, and it burned for a while. That got everybody's attention. It led to the Clean Water Act, signed by an environmental radical by the name of Richard Nixon, by the way, <laughs> and the Clean Air Act and many other things. So I grew up with that horrible choking smog. You couldn't sit in that chair there. Forget about playing. You were urged not to play as a child in the 50s and 60s when it was a smoggy day, which was 100 some odd days a year, that it would be a stage three smog alert so bad that you could not play. It wouldn't, they would tell you not to, to move, basically. But just sitting in a chair, you'd be wheezing like this, and I'm not an asthmatic now, or was I then? But you couldn't quite breathe. If anybody was in LA in those years, they know I'm telling the truth. You could not see the hills. I lived in the San Fernando Valley in the middle, and people would come from out of town, they go, why do they call it a valley here? Why is it called the San Fernando Valley or the San Gabriel Valley? Where's the valley? You couldn't, you literally couldn't see the San Gabriel Mountains, the Simi Hills, the Verdugo Hills. You couldn't see them, and it wasn't just aesthetics. As I said again, it hurt your lungs. And not just hurt in some, wow, it's painful, but I'll be okay. High incidences of, in LA of emphysema, asthma, lung cancer, there was a sad, sad case years ago of a runaway that got murdered in uh, Seattle or Portland, I don't remember, a city in the Northwest. And they, she had no ID and they were trying to figure out who she was. When they did the autopsy, they saw how bad her lungs were and they narrowed the search to Los Angeles to try to find records and it was her, of course. They knew from her lungs she was from Los Angeles. And to me, that was just unacceptable. I have to also give credit, lest you think this is some sort of partisan notion, protecting the environment. My dad was a conservative that liked to conserve. He was a great man. Everything good I learned about the environment as a young man, I learned from him. He got me into scouting. He was the son of Irish immigrants. He lived through the Great Depression. We saved string, we saved tinfoil, you didn't throw things away. And I did all that environmental stuff in 1970 to honor him as much as anything else. Because he would say to me, when I'd complain about the smog as a young man, I'd say, that smog, I, smog sucks, man. I hate smog, and why do we got to have this smog? He'd say, I know what you're against. You've said that before, Eddie. You're against the smog. I'm against it, too. That's an interesting list of the things you're against. But what are you for? What are you doing about it? Are you doing anything to make things better? So when he died in 1970, just a short time, a few days, close to the first Earth Day, I got involved to honor him as much as anything. And what did I do? What, did I, what could I do in 1970? I'll tell you in a moment what I did, but I'll tell you first what I didn't do because of other great lessons I got from him, this conservative that liked to conserve. I didn't go out and buy things I couldn't afford. I didn't buy 1970 solar panels, which were crazy expensive. They didn't have a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf back then, way out of my price range if they had it. I did every single thing that I could afford in 1970. I started recycling. I started composting. I lived in an apartment, so it was hard to compost. I had a little diaper pail with a lid on it in my, this little closet, and I would wait till it got maybe just about a third full. It was starting to smell a little bit. And I'd take it out. I didn't have, I was in an apartment, so I didn't have any place to really make compost. I went near the railroad tracks just a short, time, short distance from me in my little electric car. <laughs> take the pail out. Nobody's looking. Right near the railroad tracks, there's a little area there that wasn't going to bother the rail bed at all. And dig a little bit of hole, put the compost in. I just felt good that it was returning to the earth. I knew nothing was going to happen with it. I couldn't even really use it. But nature had another plan. Stuff started to grow there. Because when I started putting it in, there was enough rain at that point in L.A., and there was some tomato seeds in, in the compost. <laughs> Volunteer plants, we all know, we've all seen them. And they just came up, and there were suddenly tomatoes there from just this one simple act. And that got my attention. That made me see again my connectedness to the web of life and how I could be more connected. So composting, uh, right, taking public transportation, riding my bike. I even bought a 1970 electric car. People think I'm making that up. They didn't have electric cars in 1970. There was no Nissan Leaf. There was no, none of these cars. Not, those cars did not exist, but there were plenty of electric cars going back to 1910. Henry Ford's wife preferred her Baker Electric to his noisy car, so they were around. I couldn't afford a collector's item car like that. My friend Jay Leno could. Not back then he couldn't, but later he could. 
but I bought something called a Taylor Dunn electric car. I bring this up because I make electric cars to this day. They're still around in case you're thinking I'm making any of this up. Taylor-D-U-N-N-E, Taylor Dunn makes electric cars. And if you do look it up, you'll see exactly what the joke is. When I say car, I'm being quite grand. We talk about a golf cart with a windshield wiper and a horn. <laughs> it did not have a steering wheel. It had a tiller. And I was 20 years old at the time, so it was not exactly a babe magnet. <laughs> I took my... My dear friend, poor Cindy Williams, she was Shirley on Laverne and Shirley, you probably some of you might remember that show. She played Shirley on that, travels with my aunt, the conversation, did lots of movies and TV shows. But this is before any of that, we're both struggling actors. I took her out on a date in this electric car with a tiller. I did not get a second date out of the deal. I don't think I'd fully charge it. The restaurant was up a slight hill and I was like, me. There was a kid on Hot Wheels passing us by. So, but I did it, and it was more good than bad, despite that one bad evening. It suited my purposes. When I was getting a week's worth of groceries, rather than going on my bike or the bus and carrying all that heavy stuff, I would do it in the electric car. On a rainy day, I would do it in the electric car. I, uh, going to do the laundry, I'd do it in the electric car. It cost me $950, and I quickly learned this new rule about environmentalism that held true and has held true ever since. If you pick the low-hanging fruit first, if you do the stuff that you can't afford, you will do well environmentally and financially. Think about it, everything that I'm doing, I'm composting, I'm recycling, I'm eating lower in the food chain as a vegetarian, I'm taking public transportation, I'm riding my bicycle, driving an electric car I bought for $950, never had a change of batteries in the whole time I had it, I just had it a few years. There was no maintenance, there was no tune-up or oil change or fan belt or radiator flush or smog check or valve job. My fuel was plugging into the wall on my outlet, on my meter, but it was so much less than gasoline. It was cheaper to fuel than gasoline. I went, this environmental stuff is pretty good. I got extra money here in my right-hand pocket. What am I going to do with it? Well, I'll tell you what I did with it. I put some in the bank and also put some of it into medium ticket items. I picked the low-hanging fruit. Then I got a little solar oven to cook some of my meals outside on many days of the year. I'm in LA, okay? I can do it a lot. Uh, I bought a little, I bought a rain barrel to collect my rainwater, so I had water to water some of the plants I was now growing even around this apartment. They allowed me to grow a few things there in pots. You get the idea. I just kept doing all the things I could afford. Interesting list, as my dad said, the things I cannot do. Interesting, very interesting list. Where's the other list? Pull that one out. What can I do? Did that pretty soon after 15 years, a decade and a half after the first Earth Day, I then could afford solar. Still not solar electric, too pricey for me in 85, but I bought uh, solar hot water for my home in Ojai. I lived in Ojai at the time, beautiful Ojai, an area kind of near Los Angeles, very near Los Angeles, about an hour and a half away. I lived there, and I put up solar hot water there. I haven't lived there in many years, but I know people who know the folks who live there, and they say that solar hot water system is still working. What is that, 31 years later? That's a good investment. That same year, 1985, I was on a show called St. Elsewhere. It was a medical show for the young people, think ER, but before. It was a great show. Denzel Washington was on it. Lots of good people. David Morse was on it. I was on it. And it was this wonderful show that had me as a series regular. So I had extra money. How am I going to invest it? The hot stocks at that time were Exxon, you know. That was a good stock. Mobile, they were separate at that time. Lots of good stocks, you know. Uh, different coal companies, those were great investments. I decided not to do that. I thought it might be good to not put my money into those things. What did I do in 1985 with my money as investment? I bought a wind turbine in the California desert, part of a wind farm. Not, it's not directly connected to my house, but I'm feeding green electrons into the grid. That wind turbine is still working 31 years later, putting green electrons to the tune of many homes every year, putting many homes worth of power into the grid for, for 31 years. People ask me, are you carbon neutral in your life? I have to instantly say, no, I'm not. They go, well, I'm pretty disappointed in you. I went, no, I'm carbon negative since 1985 from one investment. That's a good investment. That's an investment in the future. So everything I did around my house that I lived in for 26 years, I got to talk about two houses now because the house that was featured on the show Living With Ed, did anybody here see this show Living With Ed? Okay, there was a reality show called Living With Ed that was on Home and Garden, then on Planet Green. It was about a very unusual Hollywood marriage, my wife Rochelle and I. 
we have uh, a very unusual marriage, the only Hollywood marriage I know of that has a prenup that involves carbon credits. <laughs> she was supposed to come with us on this trip, but she's a little upset with me. I don't know if I told you. I got her what I thought was a very green gift. Well, I made her a very green gift for her birthday, and she thought it was a little too organic, I guess. I found some old rope in the garage. I made her some hemp underwear, and um, apparently there was some discomfort. But she is a great lady. She's great in so many ways. And she opened my eyes to aesthetics. For years, I lived in this energy-efficient bunker that, you know, I, I just I didn't think I cared about aesthetics. As, as it turns out, I do. I just had never been exposed to them. And so we had this show, Living With Ed. And, and uh, before Living With Ed in the 90s, I had a TV show on Discovery Channel called Today's Environment. Anybody here see it? Wow, I'm impressed. I never even saw it. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, I never saw it. It was on at four in the morning at the LA market, so I never saw the show. And, it was, and there's a reason why they put it on at four in the morning. All this stuff was factual, it was all correct. I insisted that it be factual. I insisted they take no money from polluters. I was very good about that, but I'd be standing there with a little rubber washer. Hi, this rubber washer can save 125 gallons a year of water from a dripping faucet. Here's a company that's saving water and protecting the environment. <laughs> Enter Rochelle, now it's 2007. We start doing this show that's about me and all my environmental stuff, but also showing her point of view. What are you doing? Why are you riding a bike to make toast? What are you doing? I'm not gonna take the bus to get there. You know, so we have a very unusual Hollywood marriage and it was great for the show because it showed what a lot of people were thinking during the other show, Today's Environment. You know, it showed the other side. You know, are you really willing to go to those lengths? Are you going to cram all your garbage into a small glove compartment? What are you willing to do? How far will you go? And I thought everybody was going to take my side in it. It turns out a lot of smart people took her side and went, what? why are you doing some of this stuff? Relax. Uh, so it was a very successful show, and I'll tell you what I mean by successful. I would run into people constantly, it was on three years, 2007, eight, and nine, still run into the people to this day that say, because of you, I got one of those solar ovens. And I love how you have the little hinge thing so the pot doesn't spill over when you move it to keep pace with the sun, and it's got a thermometer built it right in. That's a good little thing, Ed. I'm glad you turned me on to that. They say, I got one of those rain barrels, and I, I put it up on blocks, uh, and so I, I put my garden hose down at the bottom and I water down the hill because the gravity brings it down there. And, it's, and you know, they actually did get one of those. They have a level of detail about the solar oven, the rain barrel, whatever the hell it is they got. And you know they actually did the thing. Because otherwise people come up to you in the street, hey, I'm doing all that green stuff you said. Here, sign this. <laughs> and they're nice people, but you don't know that they really did it. Thousands and thousands of people have written me, come up to me, you know, faxed me, you know, called out to me at a, at a speech and said they've done those things, and I know they've done them because of the level of detail that they have. So that's a success. All this stuff that, that you do that you call green is really just planning for the future, for your kids and grandkids. And I'm telling you, I, th I think we have to do all this stuff because otherwise our kids and grandkids are going to inherit, inherit a world that it, it's just not fair to give them that. It's just not fair. We're at a point now, we're like fish in an aquarium that have learned to nibble at the controls with no real idea of how it's affecting things. We're nibbling at the controls of the planet, the temperature of the planet. And we have to, we have to turn things around if we're going to have anything like the life that we lived. And I'm sad to say, a lot of, we talked about this today, about pessimists and optimists. Peter and I were in a forum, we talked about this. And the pessimists say, and I don't argue with them anymore, because they're correct. You're not going to do, there's enough CO2 in the pipeline now, we're over the 500 parts per million, and the permafrost is starting to melt, and so that methane from the tundra is going up, it's a feedback loop, Ed, you have to know that. You have to know that the Arctic ice is now so blackened by soot, and there's so little of it, that the albedo effect is no longer happening, so it's not shooting that you know, sunlight and heat back in the space, it's reflecting in the water, Ed, you have to know that this is going to be, I say, you're right. We're not going to save all of South Florida. Okay. 
Do you want to save Orlando? Do you want to save some of the other cities in Florida? I don't know when it's going to happen or how bad it's going to be, but there's going to be things that will happen along the coast of Florida. I believe that to my core. Things we cannot change now, no matter what we do. Bangladesh, the Marshall Islands. I, I can't tell you what the fate of those places is going to be. I believe it's going to be bad. There's nothing that we can do now, because we did not listen to James Hansen in 1987. James Hansen from NASA that talked about it in front of the Senate. OK, we didn't do that. That was then, this is now. I don't live in the past. I'm just telling you for historical reference, what, what is now? What can we do now? We can save much. Back to the optimism. We can save much. Why do I say that? Because I've seen it. I've seen it. Don't shy away from the bad news. Climate change, plastics in the ocean everywhere, coral reefs dying, all true, loss of species, all correct. But what have we done? Big ticket items globally. We had a problem with ozone depletion years ago. We knew it. You could see the hole there in the ozone. You could go up there and see the chemical signature that proved it was from CFCs. Big people of big corporations like Northern Telecom, Nortel and others said, we're going to stop using CFCs in our process. They used to use it to clean the circuit boards. Air conditioning companies, people who make refrigerators said, we're going to stop using them. We're going to come up with another way to do it. The naysayers said, you'll never be able to buy a refrigerator again. You'll never be able to afford an air conditioner with these crazy environmentalists. It's not going to do anything. It worked. It slowed the destruction globally of ozone depletion. We all did that. Corporate leaders did that. We can do this. L.A., <clears throat> it's not the whole globe, but it's a big territory, L.A. From 1970, when we started on this path, we clean air advocates, environmentalists, from 1970 to date, we have four times the cars in L.A., millions more people, yet a fraction of the smog. We did that. And guess what? Here's the shocker for the naysayers. There was jobs do fixing that. There's jobs making catalytic converters, spray paint booths, combined cycle gas turbines. I certainly can see when these people talk up, there's jobs in coal mines and there's jobs in oil derricks and refineries. Absolutely correct. Wouldn't argue with that for a second. But if you accept that, and I hope you do, are there not jobs making wind turbines and solar panels and electric cars and plug-in hybrids and energy-saving thermostats and good insulation, double-pane windows? Aren't those jobs too? Why is that money printed on flash paper that just disappears when you... <laughs> Where'd that money go? No, the people work at those companies, they go to the 7-Eleven and they go to the other market, they go to the farmer's market, they go to different places and they, they spend that money in the community and it, it makes the community more prosperous. And why not do that? When you consider there's 250 billion leaving this country every year in imported oil, that's a lot of money to leave the country. Why not keep that money here by using less imported oil? And now, now that we have so many cars with plugs, used to say, you're confusing things, Ed. You're talking about, you're going to save foreign oil. That's gasoline. You can't, you know, and you're trying to save energy around the house. They're two separate things, electricity and crude oil we make into gasoline. Now with cars with plugs, if you're saving energy in your house to make your house more energy efficient, use less electricity, you can fuel a vehicle with that. I happen to know for a fact that you cannot make gasoline on the roof of your house. I know this. <laughs> but you can make electricity on the roof of your house. Peter and Katie and I know that too. We've been doing it for a long, long time. And now it's getting more affordable. Now it's just not fancy pants people like me putting in in 1990. You can get solar in your house for no money down. Varango, Solar City, Sungevity. Put it up in your roof for no money down. If you have the proper roof, if you don't have a lot of shading, they'll go now that it's gotten advanced. They don't even send a truck out to go look at your roof. They do it on Google Maps. See, I'm looking right now. You actually don't have a good candidate roof. You have that big oak tree there. And the, how did you know that? They know because they go on Google Earth and they... They get the information and they save, save fuel driving out to your house. No, you do have a good candidate roof. We're going to send a team out and talk to you about the, uh, how this works. And if you want to go forward, you can go forward with it. This is where we're at now. We're at a good place in many ways and a very challenging place in others. But we can do it. Look what we've done. Look how far we've come. The Cuyahoga River does not catch fire anymore. Richard Nixon, the environmental zealot known as Richard Nixon, signed that into law. <laughs> and also the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, as I said earlier. And that's how we clean up the air in LA. It was a, 
We clean up the air in LA because of the Clean Air Act signed under Richard Nixon. We, the Environmental Community Coalition for Clean Air, kept having to sue these pretty good guys at the Air Quality Management District. They're friends of ours, but we had to occasionally sue them and use the Clean Air Act to sue them to help clean up the air. And then finally, bit by bit, they did the things that they needed to do. And the air is now much better. We still have pockets of smog in LA. I'm not saying we don't. There's diesel facilities, there's the port of LA, the port of Long Beach, different shipping container areas, shipping uh, hubs and what have you. So we can do this. We've shown that we can. They need that technology in Beijing and Hong Kong and Mexico City and these places where there's still such dirty air. We can export that wonderful American technology to them and they can clean up the air too. And they're starting to see the effects. Lost productivity. People are not showing up for work in these Chinese factories. Why? Why are so many people sick today? Oh, I'm sorry, but they can't breathe. They're having trouble breathing. They're at the doctor again. They're at the pulmonary specialist. Good American technology. Now, I don't want to go over my time. Oh, good. Five minutes. Let's talk about slowing down some more. <laughs> I didn't really slow down much at all. I went a mile a minute, didn't I, Peter? Just say, let us pray <laughs> But everything that I've done for the environment that I did to be a good steward, it's all been a return for me. I lived in a house, as Peter knows, he's been there. Peter and Katie have been there. I lived in it for 26 years, a very modest house, a 1,600 square foot house that I lived in for many years. Everything that I did there just lowered and lowered and lowered my bills. And I picked the low-hanging fruit first. I did the energy-saving thermostat. I did the weather stripping. I did the energy-efficient lighting. And in that very small house, I was able to live with very little electric usage. When I was single, I would use 100 bucks worth of electricity a year. But I would keep it 68 in the winter and 78 in the summer. Those temperatures don't fly anymore. I love Rochelle, but she's not going to live in, in that kind of temperature range. <laughs> and then she kept saying, and this is how we moved, we wound up moving to a lead platinum home, and I'll finish up talking about the lead platinum home I just finished. I was never going to move. I made it clear to her. We started dating in 93, and after a little while she said, you need more closet space here, and shouldn't you? No, let me stop you right there, honey. You got to start dating again. Um, I'm never moving. Never, ever. I'm never going to move. I'm never going to do it. A home remodel here, or what have you. If you need somebody with bigger closets, you've got to find another guy. I'm just never, I'm going to be composted out back, okay, Rochelle? <laughs> she said, I'll be happy to do it, she said. So um, finally, 93, I said, no, again, 94, maybe you should just have a little more, maybe another bathroom, because we're sharing the bathroom with your kids. No, honey, it's fine. We'll get along. It's family. We can share a bathroom. And then pretty soon we had a teenager of her own, Rochelle and I, and it's 2000. 10, again, I said no to her, 93, 94, 95, all the way to 2010. Now we had that show on the air that I mentioned, uh, Living with Ed, and I'd done lots of speaking engagements and green product endorsements, and I was working a lot as an actor, so we had the money, but I just didn't want to move. I just was very happy there. You know how guys kind of get set in their ways, Katie? <laughs> that was me. And so I just didn't ever want to move or do anything different or put an extra closet on or we're now sharing a bathroom with a teenager. So Rochelle said, we have the money to move, why don't we move? I said, okay, here's the deal. I will move, I finally said, after 17 years. I said, I'll move. If you could find a house with a nice south-facing roof that has a big garden so I can grow more vegetables and a, an even bigger yard to put in a big 10,000-gallon rainwater tank and you can do it for this price, I will move, Rochelle. She'll never find it. <laughs> Within a week, she found it. <laughs> So I had to take yes for an answer. And, um, but actually, then we discovered, we went into escrow hastily, but I'm glad we did. The story ends up good. Went into escrow, bought this beautiful property, and finally I said, Rochelle, come here for a second. We got the south-facing roof and what have you. What's that up there? Up, I'm pointing towards the south in the house. I'm standing at the house. What's that up there? Well, it's a tree. I said, yeah, it's a giant oak tree. Starting in October, this was, you know, like, April or something, so it wasn't shading at all. I said, starting in October and ending in March, we're going to have shading on the solar panels of this roof. We've got to go up to a second story. We can't, we can't just use this house as is. We gotta, we're going to have to do a little improvement. And then escrow closed, and we didn't make any contingencies on it. Turns out when we took the house apart, the footing was not 
good for it, you know, the, the concrete foundation. There was a lot of termite damage, water damage, so we had to start from a vacant lot, and that was troubling in some ways, but it was all the Lord's will, I'm telling you, because it all turned out great. We built from the ground up with 2016 technology. It was a long process, but it's done now. You've heard less is more, and that's the way I've tried to lead my life for many years, less is more. In this one instance, somehow more is less. By that, I mean it's bigger space. It's double the space of the previous house, but the energy bills are a fraction of what they were because it's 2016 technology, not a 1936 house. You're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. That's good. A lot of people are going to do that. I shouldn't diminish it for a minute. Lots of people are going to do retrofits. That's a good thing. That's what you're going to do. But if you're going to build from the ground up, there's ways to do it today that are so smart. And people look at the cost of a building. They look at the cost. What did that, what did that building cost? You could say, well, that building cost $850,000 to build. That's not really accurate. That's like looking at an iceberg. How big is that iceberg? Well, it's about as big as a couple of these. That's all I see. What's going on below the waterline? There's a huge iceberg below the waterline. The cost of building the house is two of these sections here. The big expense is the cost of running that house over its long life. And we built out of steel, recycled steel. So this is a house that will be around for hundreds of years. Hundreds. What's the cost of running that house over hundreds of years? A tremendous amount of money. So we're just being financially responsible because we're in it for the long run. The way my friend from the Navajo Nation, is, his people are in it for the long run. Seven generations, that's the way they plan things. That's what we need to do. Plan with seven generations in mind. There's a lot of wisdom out there about this. There's many different ways that we can do this, but they all can be and must be financially responsible as well. That's what true environmentalism is, as Peter was saying just today in the forum. It's not the environment versus the economy. The environment and the economy, they work intrinsically. You can't have a healthy environment without a healthy economy. You can't have a healthy economy without, an environmental, without a healthy environment. Bobby Kennedy says it, you know, show me pollution, I'll show you somebody escaping the discipline of the free market. Making yourself richer by making everybody else poorer, by having pollution go out into a stream or waterway out of the Chesapeake Bay and pollute that bay. Well, I, gotta, I obeyed by the rules and that's not my problem, you guys will pay to clean that up. That's not right. You're destroying the commons. That's very old law in America and around the world. You can't destroy the commons. And that's what we need to think about. Enforcing these laws, protecting the environment, doing something for our children that will last a long time, as the environment has lasted a long time for us. We sit here today because people were more environmental stewards than not. That's how we get to be here today. Let's repeat those successes and build upon them. Peter, thank you so much for having me. We have time for questions. Oh, yeah. Questions. We made sure and we left time for questions for you. So if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. Melody, thank you. Do you want to start, Peter, or should I? Okay. First thing I would look at is lighting. Right away, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. LEDs have gotten very inexpensive. You could certainly get the CFLs. They have a small amount of mercury in them, but you're making more mercury if you don't get the bulb by burning coal puts mercury out in the air where you can't retrieve it. A CFL, you can retrieve it, take it back to Home Depot, they'll re recycle it and dispose of it safely. I'm not lobbying for CFLs. I'm just saying if you're on a real budget, can't afford an LED, do something, it's going to be better for the environment. So lighting is number one. Number two would be an energy-saving thermostat, but don't just buy it 
and hook it up or have your electrician hook it up, program it. <laughs> Take that extra minute or two to program it. Wake and sleep, leave and return mode, so it really saves you that energy the way it should. And weather stripping, those are three quick ones. I'm going to give a fourth. Weather stripping is very easy to put up now. It has kind of an adhesive back. You peel the strip off and put it up around doors and windows. That's pretty easy to do nowadays. The other one is vampire power. I forgot to talk about this. Vampire power, like a vampire, it's sucking from you, giving you nothing in return. It's also called phantom power. It's stuff that you think is off that is not really off. Your TV, oh, I've turned it off. It's not off. It's still sucking 150, 200 watts sometimes. So it can be on instantly when you run in. I gotta get that game on, boink, and it's on right away. Well, if you put it on a power strip, when you leave the house to go to sleep, those things you do not need on when you leave the house to go to sleep, you put them on a power strip, you might need maybe three in a normal household. One, two, three, you go off. One, two, three, turn them off when you leave. One, two, three, turn them off when you go to sleep. Turn them back on in the morning when you need them on, and you'll save, right away you'll see savings on your bill. Right away, huge savings. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Peter? Yep. Ed and I sat with a bunch of students, a uh, group of students uh, this morning for almost two hours in dialogue. Is Sarah here? Sarah? Okay. She was one of the participants. And we started talking about churches buying cooperatively. How many of you are involved in a parish here? Okay. Do any of you buy cooperatively? How many churches are involved in your cooperative? And what are you buying? Uh, uh, energy, office supplies, office supplies, knives, cleaning supplies. Um, it's always here. And I, I apologize, I don't know which part of it, but it's sort of. That's okay. The answer, did everybody hear his answer? They're buying a lot of stuff. Power, cleaning supplies. <laughs> Cooperatively. What is your estimated savings? Okay, find out and, and put it on an email to everybody here, okay? Okay, this is one very effective way of building relationship among churches non-competitively, saving money, your vestries will love it. To buy cooperatively, you can get discounts up to 25, 30% sometimes. Paper alone, you put out a messenger every Sunday, you, you send out a newsletter, whatever, you can get dramatic savings that way. You also buy paper that is high post-consumer content. You can, there's a lot of ways you can save in, in the big picture and as well as, as short term. How many of you at your parish functions serve food? <laughs> How many of you have ever thought about the food you serve and the impact on the environment? Tell me about it. Okay, did you all hear that? Buys organic, compost, social, uh, local sourcing of food, all of these things. How, um, Ed and I both have a friend by the name of Howard Lyman. You may, may not know his name, but you know the guy that took on eating hamburger on the Oprah Winfrey show? And Oprah said, I give up hamburger. Next day, the Texas Cattlemen Association sued Oprah. They sued the wrong person. <laughs> they lost, big time. Because Oprah understood what Howard was talking about in terms of the impact of raising beef on this planet. There's more aggregate weight of beef cattle on the planet, there are human beings. The waste is triple. The energy used to produce a pound of beef is an equivalent to the energy in the bread and the grains and so forth used to feed the cow. Okay, there are a variety of reasons. Howard Lyman gave this explanation and the result was the cattleman versus Oprah. Ed and I are very conscious of what we put on the ends of our fork because the food choices we make all the way from complete vegan, <coughs> pescatarian, vegetarian, I eat fish. Grew up eating fish, I will probably always eat fish, and I've understood it 
as much as I can in terms of the big picture. We all have food choices three times a day, and if you're a snacker, five times a day. We have food choices. If we eat lower on the food chain in our personal lives, we'll look like this. Or this. That's what has helped me. That's what's helped Ed for sure. To I'm eat sucking it in now, now that you said that. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> You, you can take the guy out of Hollywood, but you can take, take the Hollywood out of the guy. <laughs> uh, having a little fun, but at the same time, parish dinners are a teaching tool. Every time you preach a sermon, it's a teaching opportunity. Every time we perform a baptism, we perform a wedding or a funeral, it's a teaching opportunity. Every time you have a parish dinner, it can be a teaching opportunity and help people to understand the value of eating lower on the food chain. It's a, it's a big difference. And one of the things you can eat are cell phones. I'm worried there's some big story breaking now when a few cell phones go off like that. Oh, what's happening in the world? Yes, that's right. Salt and pepper especially, but with ketchup would be great. Yes, ma'am, question. This happened a number of years ago when I was with my husband at a picnic for Prudential Life Insurance up in New Jersey. Huge picnic. We had that nice, hard plastic uh, plates and all these plates, and one little drop of something on it, and it was all going in the garbage. And I said, do you know what that smells like, what that puts in the air when you burn plastic? So I'm a big one about... we got to get rid of plastic-ware and get our roll up our sleeves and wash the dishes, you know. And uh, that's been a problem in our churches. People regularly, for, for the ease of it, I understand, and the convenience and the water use, people say, well, I don't want to waste water, so that's why I'm doing this. There's reasons you can give for single-use plastic. And let me tell you, I'm not opposed to all plastics. This is a perfectly wonderful use of plastic, as is my computer, as is there's many things that I think are and can and should be made out of plastic. But single-use plastic is the kinds of things that you're talking about, I believe, and the kind of things I'm, I've gotten away from in my life, and my life works just fine. I serve things on plates. We have big, medium, and small events, 70 people coming to an event. It's all just regular, you know, uh, cookware, plateware, you know, plates and, and real metal knives and forks, and that's what we do. There's such a a deluge of plastic in our oceans now. It's gotten so bad. You go to the island of Guam and other places like that, the currents bring it right through there. It just rakes across Guam and there's horrible plastic and it's all over. And it's not just on the top. People say, well, just get boats and we'll skim it. That's like saying you're going to get a little hand sieve and skim the Sahara. You're not able to do that. And not all of it is on the surface. And if you did skim the surface, you'd get lots of other unwanted bycatch, other fish and what have you that are on the surface and a lot of it's in the middle and a lot of it's very down deep. So the best we can do now is eliminate single-use plastic, those throwaway bags and cups and spoons and plates and what have you, and stop doing that so this deluge of plastic doesn't keep entering our streams, our waterways, our, our oceans. Part of, part of breaking habits in a church is you bring in the treasurer on the discussion. Because we found when we went from the elimination of all styrofoam at the parish, and styrofoam has a half-life of 10,000 years. That means it takes that many years to it decrease to half its size. That's what it means. Not many people know what half-life means. It means you have, you have a piece of plastic, and over 10,000 years, that plastic will diminish to half its size. OK. One of the wonderful inventions is a dishwasher. These hands do a pretty good job, I know, because 
The day we arrived at the Cape House, the dishwasher died. Two days later, Katie went back to Los Angeles to work, and I'm there with our 17-year-old granddaughter for two weeks without a dishwasher. She and I learned how to wash dishes very efficiently. But if you have a dishwasher in your church facility, buy styro get rid of the styrofoam and buy <coughs> ceramic cups. They wash very well. You can put on a, you know, it doesn't have to be an intense dishwasher cycle to wash coffee out of a coffee cup. There are a lot of things that we can do, and you're correct about plastics. I happen to have been out with Captain Charles Moore, mm. um, Al Galita, Al Galita Foundation, out on the ocean with nets catching plastic. And matter of fact, I've, I've done a, a photographic exhibit on the amount of plastics in our world's oceans. Um, it is very sad because there are gyres that collect all of this. There's more plastic in our world's oceans now than phytoplankton. Mm. Phytoplankton is disappearing. Plastic is replacing it. Loggerhead turtles, everybody else, they don't like that very much. So m back to the parish. We model behavior in the parish. It can influence people in their home. And you have just witnessed one of the best examples of how to do this. Sense of humor, self-deprecating. He doesn't yell at people, and you get the message. I don't. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and in the parish, to do by example that is wonderful, because then if the parish changes, then the parishioners will change in their own homes and, and work together on this. And it does save money. It does save money to go green, without question. Any other questions? Question back there, we'll get you ma'am. There you go. You both seem to know about the movie Baggett. Ed Begley, were you in the movie Baggett? With Baggage, I'm embarrassed to say Baggett. I don't. Baggett. Baggett. Oh, Baggett. I, no, I was not in Baggett, and I'm I, embarrassed to say I have not seen it either. Okay, I thought you were in it. Suzanne Barraza filmed it and Jeb Barrier was the everyman narrator. I got, I got to amend what I just said. Sometimes I say that and somebody sends me a copy of it and I am in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I might be in it. Yes. <laughs> I think you are in it. And it's a full length documentary on plastics and what they have done to our lives and our world since the 70s, 60s or 70s, I guess. Right. And I would recommend that everybody check this movie out, Bag It! Exclamation point. It's, it's funny. It won the popularity uh, contests at film festivals. But it changes your life. It's all about the plastics in the oceans, the gyres, the plastic gyres. Mm -hmm. And I think you are in it, Ed. I might be. I, I trust you. I defer to you. I'm going to tell you very quickly also to follow up on that. It was throwaway stuff that got my attention about the environment before 1970. I'm just remembering this this moment. It was 1965 or so. I used to get the money from the bottles. You take back a Coke bottle or a root beer bottle this big, it was two cents. The big root beer or Coke bottle was five cents. That was my money if I took it back, and I did, and I got another you know, few bucks every few days you know, from those deposits. Suddenly they had something called no deposit, no return bottles. Right. They had the more plastic stuff. There was more, everything was becoming throwaway in the 60s. It started then. And I, it got my attention. I went, wait a minute. First of all, they took my money so that I had my full attention. And then the, wait, now where does all this stuff go? You keep taking stuff out of the environment, out of the earth. You make minerals and you take trees down to make them into wooden things. And you throw it in this big unusable salad called a landfill. landfill. And so that, how long can we keep doing that? It was throwaway that got my attention in 65. Yep. Yep. See that movie. I want to see it myself. <laughs> uh, one last thing, then I'll bring Melody up. Virginia Seminary is taking a remarkable position related to the bringing of understanding the collapse of God's creation to what we can do practically. <coughs> and Ed kind of symbolizes that. He symbolizes it in the Hollywood community. He's he walks the talk like no one else. But Virginia, and, and we had a chance to go around the golf cart, look at the gardens and so forth, and, and what's happening here, to the students that are pushing this envelope and continuing to bring the two together. We are the hope. 
manifesting through these young people that are coming to seminary and focusing on how they can go back to their communities and bring the environmental ethic to bear on the life of the community in which they serve. That gives me such hope. Ed and I were talking about it mm -hmm. earlier. Where do we see hope? And I've seen it over the years. I, I graduated in 1969 from Virginia, so I've been gone a while. But I've been coming back here because of the Kreitler Environmental Lectures and so forth. And I want to thank you, those of you who have supported the fund and for what it goes into for here. And there's Reagan Satterfield, who's beautiful book, and he just graduated last year, and his, his work, um, Robin's work here with the gardens. We should be proud as a community of faith that what we're putting into action is empowering and giving strength to a heck of a lot of people, and we'll grow that throughout the entire diaspora. So on behalf of Katie and myself and the Kreitler family, I want to thank you for supporting this. Here, here. On behalf of all who are present today, I just really warmly, warmly thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. It's the kind of lectures that really change your life, so thank you. And I think, Ken and Kreitler, you are exactly right to, to name our students. They provide so much of the energy, and um, they are helping lead the way for us all as a community. That and the work of the faculty members, people like um, Kathy Grieb, Kate Sonderegger, and your classes. Together, we're learning more and more about what more we can do, and we're so very it's our, it's our deepest honor and calling to be part of that project. Um, there's lots for you to do today, this afternoon. Just to remind you that we've, um, we're trying out pop-up sessions this, this year. As you, as interests emerge and you put your questions on the board, please check and see if um, some have responded and are um, ready to meet with you and to talk about the interests that you have. Um, so that would, information would be upstairs in the lobby. Um, Cultivate VTS is offering garden tours. Come and see what we're doing, what we're trying to do, some things that will last, um, and some things that will, our ideas are just for the time. But go and see how an um, uh, institution with 88 acres inside the Beltway can uh, take seriously that calling and what may be some ideas that you can steal. Um, the Center for the Ministry of Teaching is holding an open house in Key Hall, um, and they've always got lots of resources and good ideas as well. The library, Bishop Payne Library, has a special exhibit on environmental resources, including the Kreitler Environmental Fund. And of course, we all know that you're really here for one another, so I would also encourage you not to feel guilty if you just want to sit and um, meet someone new or talk with an old friend. Uh, as we end our day, I, t I invite you to take seriously the moment, the call to, s to sit still for a minute and come pray with us at Evensong. It starts promptly at 5 o'clock. Thank you for being here. Please join me in thanking our, our speaker once again. Thank you.